When you watch movies now, do you notice the textiles? Every outfit, every blanket, every bag comes from a maker somewhere. My next guest, Tara Sinclair of Uh Oh Creations, recently had the commission to make the bags for the HBO series, The Last of Us. And it's a lot more in depth and involved than you can imagine and she's gonna tell us all about it. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Tara Sinclair. So Tara, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Whereabouts in Canada are you coming to us from? Karen, thanks for having me. I am coming from Calgary, Alberta. Are you originally from the Calgary area? Oh, so originally born in Alberta, but raised mostly in Northern BC. So up in the Quinnell, Prince George area, nowhere near that lower mainland stuff. So when did you come back to Calgary? Oh, God, it had to be 15 years ago. I came back to Calgary. My sister was having her last baby. Oh, man, this has to be 17 years ago now. <laughs> and I was being the godmother for that one. So I figured it was time to, to come near the family again and, and be near, near them. So I stopped my moonlighting in the Banff and Jasper region and came to the city to be serious. So were there any other quilters or crafters in your family? Oh, you know, what's interesting is um, around the time that I picked up quilting was about a year after my mom had picked up quilting and my sister had dabbled with quilting, my little sister. But in my family, my mom, when I was a kid and my older sister, used to make a lot of our costumes and a lot of our clothing and whatnot. So even when my older sister got married, my little sister and I get gowns, I'm, I'm gonna use the term gown, <laughs> made by my, my mom and sister. And they had the puffy sleeves and, and the beautiful uh, heart necklines and the big, big dresses with crinolines and, and everything. And they made those for my sister's wedding, but I grew up in a family where my mom made the best rainbow bright costume ever for Halloween. Even had the skirt that had the little poofy tube around the bottom and I was rainbow bright. So I, I do come from a family that, that sewed quite a bit, but as I grew up and as I became a teenager and everything, of course, nobody can make something for me that I wanted. So a lot of that got dropped when my sister and I became teenagers and it got picked up again as adults bit of a journey there. <laughs> so when did you take your first quilting class? Ooh, so 2014. I, I say I learned to quilt the right way. Uh, <laughs> I called up a quilt shop and took their beginner quilting class and they helped me find a beginner machine. They helped me with choosing the fabrics for that very first quilt based upon, of course, my feature fabric and then finding coordinates. It was just rails and blocks. So learning how to properly piece a quarter and seam allowance. And so 2014, it was a local quilt shop. Couldn't do it without them. They had me tear out my first seams because they were not quarter inches and they did check with a ruler. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing because you learned the, the rotary cutting as well as the piecing, as well as how to press. There's a whole technique to pressing. Then we got into making the entire quilt top, the sandwiching, and they even had us do our own quilting on it. So to try out a little free motion quilting as well as stitch in the ditch and all on the very first quilt. Wow. Very How first. long was the course? It was two months. I want to say every other Saturday. I know it was just a lap size quilt. But it was amazing. I don't think I could be doing nearly as much without those basics, like especially the rotary cutting and rulers and, and the mats and learning the right way of holding a ruler. <laughs> There's some basics there that I don't think I could have done without. So is there a lot of precision in your day job that you have brought into quilting and bag making? Absolutely. Um, I kind of see my day job and my pattern designing and creative work very, very similarly. My day job, I spend a lot of time doing architecting of software. So somebody says, I need a software to do something. And I say, okay, so we need to have these pieces. We need these pieces to do this across the, the process. And it needs to come out as this. And so that's the same thing with quilting. I need the right pieces 
to merge them through the process to get to the end result. And you have to have that picture of the end result in your mind to be able to get from point A to point B to point X way at the other end. Sometimes G, H, I are never not in line <laughs> as much as we'd like to think they are. So you have to think, okay, let's go G, I, then let's come back to H. But being able to be flexible in that and come up with something at the beginning to go to the very end makes a, a lot of sense to me. Plus being in software as my day job, you have to be very particular about every little detail. Uh, what's the trigger? What's the outcome? How do you put them together? Sometimes what breaks a system is that you use the capital letter when you wrote the code. And, and I'm finding those for my developers. I'm not doing the code. And so sometimes it's about putting that zipper in with the wrong seam allowance that breaks the project. <laughs> so I find that that attention to detail that comes from my day job is right with me in in my my crafting and my creative outlet and my designing and all of those pieces so at what point did you switch from making quilts into making bags <laughs> I, i'm presuming that you haven't eliminated doing quilts but oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh no no even that one right behind me that one was fun in 2014 i made that very first quilt and then i took on another project that was a lot of repeatable pieces taking um, 10 inch squares of background, 10 inch squares of accent, sewing them together, cut them apart, sew them together, cut them apart. And I was making a full size queen quilt. It took way too long. <laughs> and so this was 2015, like it, it was within the first year, but it, it was 2015 where I picked up a Pink Sands Designs quilt kit. And it, it was just some jelly roll strips and a button and some interfacings. And it was a big, it was a teeny tiny foam pouch. And I made it in an afternoon. And that's when I realized projects that I'm making in my sewing room don't need to take as long as projects in my day job. And I could have these little, really rewarding quick wins. And so after finishing that one in an afternoon, I'm like, ooh, that was great. And I went and got another Pink Sand Design kit. And I made another one. And that's when I, I realized I needed these quick wins to allow me to come back to those longer term projects like the quilts. So I never did eliminate quilting. Never, ever. I, I still love to have a project that has no interfacing and has no zippers and has no hardware. Uh, but at the same time, stretching my brain with curved piecing and some fancy top stitching and things like that that's where my brain stretches <laughs> and that's where I get those those exercises in and that's where I I love that curved sewing and the 3D objects so I I still do both I have a moon dance quilt um in my whip pile and it is all curved piecing but it's still quilting and that's a so kind of wonderful pattern I love being able to take all those fabrics all at once instead of just two on a bag <laughs> I am one of those people that if you can use four why not 40 <laughs> exactly like really who needs to limit us down to a couple of fabrics where did the name uh-oh creations come from <laughs> oh the name question yes drinks were involved <laughs> <laughs> My best friend, my husband and I were sitting around one day and I had decided that I needed to create a Facebook page that was isolated from Tara C. Sinclair because all my high school friends and my old work friends didn't need to see all my bags. So we decided we needed to come up with a name for this. And we started with uh, Strawberry. That was my nickname back in high school. Uh, Strawberry Designs, but SBD as initials just didn't quite work for me because that really in the teenage world is silent but deadly. So wasn't doing SBD. So we started tossing around some of those names that are in the sewing world. And one that I threw out there is Funky Monkey Fabrics. I, it, it rolls really great. You remember it. I am not affiliated in any way. Um, and, and so my husband said, well, what about ornate orangutans? And I'm like, no. I'm just dead patting you, dear. No. <laughs> I'm like, really? I'm going to go by, oh, 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 
oh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, this just makes so much sense. Uh-oh, everything I make has a mistake. I am not perfect. I am just a human being. And how many times do I make an uh-oh and have to make that a design element? So uh-oh came out and, and we went down the path. So when Googling me, look for uh-oh creations. It is important. Don't just Google uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good day job and you have a hobby that you enjoy. When did you decide to turn it into a side hustle and start designing patterns? When I got asked by a new fabric designer to showcase their fabric on bags, I decided that that was when, if he was going to show that fabric on bags, I was going to make them my bags, my designs. And if he was going to talk about those designs, he needed to send people somewhere to be able to make them, which means they needed to have patterns. That was really the kick in the butt I needed to start drafting my patterns. And he was going down to Houston Quilt Market with those bags, with that new fabric line. And I needed my patterns at Houston Quilt Market. <laughs> so this was uh, Brett Lewis of Natural Born Quilter. He reached out to me. It was his first fabric line. You have to support local. He's Edmonton, I'm Calgary. <laughs> yeah. Close enough. <laughs> you have to support local. <laughs> And Canadians supporting Canadians when it comes down to getting our stuff out there and, and getting into the U.S. market, it, it is a challenge. And being able to support each other is a huge thing. So your pattern making is, did you start from scratch or did you have an idea of how to lay it out and um, put it into steps and get the illustrations done? I learned brand new software from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm going to invent this, I'm going to invent a whole new wheel. <laughs> In my day job, I deal with Microsoft Visio, Word, Excel, and I will draft documentation on how to use software, that kind of thing. So writing step-by-step -step instructions, I can do. That, that was something I was already used to. But if I was going to do patterns, I was going to do it the right way using the right tools that were going to sustain, be sustainable for a long period of time, not something quick and easy to, and dirty to get it out. So I learned how to use Adobe Illustrator to draft my pattern pieces. I learned Adobe InDesign in order to put those pattern pieces and instructions into a document. And then I went back to Illustrator and learned how to create diagrams for every single step. Sure, I could have taken photos. I am not a photographer and I really feel I suck at it. <laughs> so I was not going to do the photography of step-by-step. -step. I was never happy with the photos I was taking. So diagrams was the way I went for all of that. And that meant hours of watching YouTubes, sitting in an, if I was sitting in an airport, I had my laptop and I had my glass of wine and I was sitting at a bar figuring out how to work Illustrator. I have my Adobe account, which means that I now work with Adobe Express for creating my posts online. So I'll be able to mash up photos and use some funky fonts. Another software on my phone for video editing before I even get to TikTok. So I'll, I'll take my video clips, I'll condense them down, I'll do some tweaks, I'll take some photos and do some zoom ins and zoom outs on my phone with that, all through my Adobe software that I had to learn for it. So. That also gave me that educational opportunity. <laughs> if, if you think that you're ever going to get stale doing something like this, just don't even let that thought cross your mind. I met you last year at the Bernina Ambassador meeting at the C Canadian headquarters. And I was really interested in the way you talked about hardware. And it's funny, just listening to you talk right now, I think of all the skills that I had to change when I moved from garment sewing into quilting. What were the things that you had to change when you moved from quilting into bag making? I had to raid my husband's garage. Let's start with that. So I actually have a tool collection now that snap on tools. So my husband's a mechanic and has his dealer and they have 
my high quality seam ripper, my mallet, my torch. <laughs> so I now use screwdrivers more frequently than, than my seam rippers. I have painter's tape that I use for marking things. I have a hammer as well as a rubber mallet. Each have their purpose. I have a pair of, of snippers that I use for metal snipping, uh, things like that. So going from quilting into getting to use tools that you never thought sewers should be using <laughs> was kind of fun. And taking problems to my husband and allowing him to help me troubleshoot. Hey, I've got this rivet and I don't know how to get it out. And I don't want to wreck the fabric it's in. What can you do to help me? <laughs> and he he's a mechanic as well as a, he dabbles in blacksmithing. So we have some random things in that garage. But it, it allows us both to, to think a little outside that box and not be afraid to raid something from his cabinets that are going to work with my fabric. Sometimes we have to clean them before I can bring them in the sewing room. <laughs> there, there's some messy tools. But even going from just the tools into my industrial sewing machine that I use for bag making when I'm making leather projects and everything, He's the one who set it up for me, marked all the oil points for me, identified the mechanical components. And if I have a problem, I've got my mechanic right on hand because it's, it's all very, I have friends that call it my tractor. It comes with an oil pan. It needs a mechanic, <laughs> not a computer consultant. It, it's a whole different world that way. Very mechanical when it comes to the bag making with the hardware versus that, that computer brain that I, I typically use. So in bag making, what is the presser foot that you use most often? Oh, I have three presser feet I use on every single project, the regular one, uh, because it, it has the best uh, grip for holding things against your feed dogs. The second one is either a stitch in the ditch or an edge stitch foot. It has a metal guide in the middle, and then I move my needle off to the side so I can run my fabric against that guide and top stitch at a perfect one eighth of an inch. And I use that for almost every bit of top stitching I do. And then the third one is my zipper foot. I can't live without a zipper foot. And it's funny because I teach a lot of classes with some very advanced bag makers and they've never used a zipper foot before. They never took the time to learn what it's good for. And it just changes their world once they realize what what it can do for them. And even that, that zipper foot isn't just for zippers, but when you're sewing a 3D object, sometimes you need an edge standing up and you just need to be close to it, not just for zippers. So when did you become a teacher? My entire career, careers through my industries that I've been in, I have always been the educator for every one of those. So when I was in hospitality, because I started when I first got out of high school in hotels, so when I was in hospitality, I moved my way up and I started teaching people there. And as I moved into oil and gas, because I'm in Alberta, I had to do oil and gas at some point. If we got new employees, Tara taught them. Uh, it, when I'm on software, half of my job isn't just architecting the software, but it's also training end users. So I'm, I'm naturally teaching there. And then it kind of just falls into place for me with sewing. I can break down the steps into comprehensible pieces and allow them to, it's the comprehension, break it down and, and let them go step by step. Okay, now that you've put your presser foot down, now let's look at the next step and how we accomplish this goal. So it was, oh, I wanna say 2017, my first class happened because a friend of mine, Purple Cats Quilting, um, her name is Tracy, she reached out to me and said, I have this retreat and we want to do a small project. We just want to do the free retreat bag from Emmeline Bags. It's the installation of a zipper. It's a boxed bottom and you can put these frames in. And I'm like, oh, I've made millions of those. Yeah, sure. Let's teach it. Why not? I had no clue what a retreat was. Let's start with that. No clue. But I thought, why not? I also had no clue that this retreat was 40 people. So my very first class was teaching the retreat bag to 40 people at a retreat and we had a blast. It was amazing. I do a lot of running around. I get my steps in on teaching days. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm all about the hands-on, trying to catch people before a mistake happens so that we limit the use of Jack the Ripper. But, you know, it's, it's so rewarding when someone says, I had no clue, and that light bulb goes off in their brain. It's totally that happy moment. And you know what, even I'm learning from those classes. When I am bag making with somebody who Garmin sews or somebody who's been quilting in the industry for 20 years, I am learning even in those classes I teach. It, it's so engaging that way. Yeah, it isn't, isn't that always interesting how the teacher always comes away with something new as well? Every time. And sometimes that's just about how to work with people. <laughs> sometimes one of those tips comes out have you passed on your love of bag making to any members of your family oh well kind of I have a stepdaughter I met her and her, my husband when she was eight years old and I became a full-time mom and when she was in high school she did take on some sewing in in her high school classes and then when I started quilting and bag making that garment sewing kind of filtered over there and every so often she'll show up in my sewing room and say I want to make this and I'm like great let's figure it out <laughs> and I don't do it for her Let, let's put it that way I will help her with the machine and I will help her change threads and whatnot because my machine may not be the one she's she's used to but she has this idea right now to make a uh, to upcycle a denim jacket and she sent me this picture and it's got this see-through back on it that's got all this embroidery on it and she's like where would I find this lace type stuff that I could put in it I'm like let's make it the Bernina does embroidery let's get some tool let's make it you go find a jacket so give me time it's coming <laughs> and I will set her up on the machine and I will give her the tips and tricks and we'll work on it and we'll have a blast now not when she was a teenager now <laughs> <laughs> So she well, does have now you can bring in a glass of wine too exactly exactly <laughs> now we can have a drink with our sewing <laughs> so it's 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 really rewarding that she's not looking at me like seriously you made that instead she's looking at it like "Ooh, what can we do now so you got on my radar um i think brandy maslowski was the first person to mention you in my circle of people and she was going on about this Logan bag that you have. <laughs> and it, it is, she showed it to me. And it's such an amazing bag. Is that your own design? It sure is. Um, so Logan was actually one of my very first patterns that I had released. It's asymmetrical. So that was quite the challenge. Uh, it, it's easy to make a circle or it's easy to make a rectangle and curve some corners on it and then put a gusset around it. But when you come up with a, an asymmetrical design, all of a sudden everything has to fit like a perfect puzzle. So it kind of stretched my skill set. I had to, to learn the software to, to make this right. And so Logan is a crossbody bag that has an expandable gusset. And it was kind of the all encompassing travel bag or horseback riding bag or motorcyclist bag where it's completely hands-free snug right up into the body and easy to wear and that was the whole goal of it something that made sense against every body type it was the first of four patterns I released at one time yeah four I had to think about that <laughs> right at the beginning of my pattern designing career it was a challenge and it, it was a ton of fun. The one I made for Brandy was actually out of Kay Facet fa fabrics for her trip out to the UK. I had a Tim Holtz version, but she was gonna go meet the Kay Facet team and Tim Holtz fabrics just don't scream Kay Facet. <laughs> no, 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 they're in a different palette altogether. Exactly. Well, one of the things I, I that frustrates me about bags. Like I've had a, a couple of really nice bags, but I've had to pass them on because they no longer fit what I need a bag to do. I need it to carry a water bottle. I need it to carry my phone. And I can't tell you how many pockets don't fit my phone, the larger iPhone. And, you know, it's got to have a place for uh, keys and dog bags and things like that. Um, how 
rigorously do you take your patterns for a test drive? Oh, so when I make one, I'll carry it around and I'll put everything in it in my house that I can think of to see if it's going to work. Now, I'm not also that type of person that has a lot of Tupperware around to check all the water bottles, but that's what I have pattern testers for. <laughs> They're going to come up with those random uses for this bag that I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. Holy cow. So I will make a bag and I'll make it around specific purposes. So I'm not one of those individuals or pattern designers that likes to make a ton of purses because I'm not a purse carrier. I want a functional bag. I've got a duffel bag. I've got the backpack that carries my laptop and was built specifically for that. I have the Chris Satchel that's designed to carry a tablet, specifically an iPad size. <laughs> Let's be honest here. Not all tablets are created equally. So I, I generally focus on what do I want to make a bag around and then design it around those specs. So my Buddy ID pouch is a, a pattern that can be upsized or downsized depending upon the device you're putting in it. And it was designed as a pattern that you could wear with a lanyard um, around your neck. It would hold a name tag for conferences as well as has a zipper pocket for your hotel room key and your credit card. And then your cell phone on the other side. And it can be upsized and downsized because our devices are changing every year we started with flip phones those slipped into every pocket <laughs> like now people are holding tablets against their faces like it's they the sizes are drastically changing and so phones are a prime example of i will call things a device pocket not necessarily a phone pocket or a a pen pocket things like that because i know that it's changing every day, every day. So the rigorous testing, I, I do carry my bags when I make them initially, especially my prototypes, or I will make them for a specific purpose and give it a shot. My duffel bag pattern that I did, the John duffel bag has three sizes, the small, medium, and large, or little John, John, and big John. <laughs> and my husband carries big John, I carry medium John, and that's our camping bags every weekend when we head out to the camper. So they they get used. So when you well. make a prototype, how how many versions do you go through? Oh, I am that attention to detail fanatic. So I'll be honest, I only make a prototype typically. Then I'll make a couple of tweaks while I'm writing the pattern. I'll do one more and then I'll have my pattern finalized and ready for testers, unless something is a catastrophic failure. I do have a, a sling bag over here where I've taken the back off of it like four times and it, it's in the catastrophic failure stage where it will require a full new prototype after I have modified the crap right out of all of those pattern pieces. <laughs> catastrophic failure doesn't necessarily mean it's never going to see the light of day. It means it needs a whole revamp on a bunch of stuff. Now, you had a really exciting thing happen to you last year. You made the bags for Bella Ramsey and Pedro Pascal in their... The HBO TV series, The Last of Us. And oh, that, that was that an opportunity adventure. happened. Oh, that was such an adventure. Um, that was a referral. So I had a referral where the, the guy who was reaching out was part of the props company. That was a funny story because my girlfriend from Emmeline Bags, uh, when she gets teaching engagements or or speaking engagements, she'll con she'll frequently say, uh, "Here's Tara's number," <laughs> because she's just not a not fond of doing those kinds of engagements. So even in this case, where somebody contacted her and said, "We need some bags made," is this something that Emmeline Bags can help out with? She's like, "Oh no, 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 we're hardware." However here's a resource for you. So the city of Calgary um, was hosting this props company and HBO and, and all of the, the subcontractors under that for the filming of this TV show. And I got this email from a random Gmail account. In my mind, it was a very random Gmail account. Te technology consultant off to the Google with everything I could think of. His, the guy's name, the, the companies that he's dropping, 
everything like that, plus the message from Emmeline saying, hey, gave your email out. <laughs> And it, it seemed really shady to me. It, it just, there, there was nothing really in my mind. I'm like, I, this is a scam, but sure, let, let's engage it. Let's see what happens. And of course, this is during COVID. So you're not seeing people face to face and you're not doing a lot of face to face. But he had contacted me as uh, inquiring if I would design specific bags that they have images of so that they could use them in a TV series. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And, and he dropped The Last of Us as a name and he's like, it's based on some video game. And I'm like, okay, sure. And so I dropped that name to my stepdaughter and she's like, oh, <laughs> she avidly plays this game. She is the, the epitome of the gamer of this game, like the fan of this game. If there's a new version coming out, she will be up till midnight waiting for it at the store in the lineup of 700 people to get that version right over the moon. All of a sudden, I was slammed with information from her about this game that was way more information than I ever wanted to know about any game. <laughs> Him and I chatted through it and we talked about some of these designs and I said, yeah, sure, I could make you a bag. He's like, well, then we're going to need about five or ten copies of that same bag. And I may have a couple more if, if this goes well. Well, it went very, very well. <laughs> so I ended up sourcing the materials. They assisted with some of that material sourcing. Uh, the props company, I worked directly with him just so that I wasn't bombarded during the day because I still have the full-time day job. And he would be flexible with me in working with my schedule, but they happen to be, I, I live near the industrial area of Calgary. So he happened to be right working in that industrial area. So he could pop by and drop things off or pick things up. And I ended up making seven different backpacks. Each backpack, I had to document my process on because I had to make multiple versions of each of them, three, four, 10, uh, so that they could film in multiple locations at a time or get one bag completely drenched and still have a dry one to pull out. So I made multiple versions of each. And one of the bags, I actually engaged a friend of mine to help me out because I just didn't have enough hands to sew them all and had her sew some of them for me. So I had to have better instructions to, to walk somebody else through this too. <laughs> So basically I ended up with seven different unique backpack designs all seen within this TV series, The Last of Us. So you have Joel, the main character, Tess, uh, his girlfriend, you have Ellie and then her best friend are both carrying them, Henry and Sam. There was going to be another scene where there was a school group of children that were carrying uh, little drawstring backpacks made of found materials. And I sewed all 40 of those bags as well. <laughs> so I'd get a phone call on a Thursday and say, hey, Tara, we're going to film this character on Saturday. We have a new backpack. And I'm like, new. So none of the other designs. And he'd be like, no, no, we, we haven't made this design yet. No. <laughs> and not. He's like, well, how soon can I have it? Can you send me a picture before I answer that question? <laughs> and I would have two of a new backpack made up for them on Monday. I'd be like, no, no, Saturday ain't happening, but I will work all weekend and I will have two bags for you on Monday. And, and it, it was a challenge. It was a huge challenge. The full design process, prototyping, sending photos back and forth to make sure I got the details all right and then having it to them in time for them to do the breakdown process. So, so Joel's backpack is covered in duct tape, has, is really rough, it's, it's stained. It, it was a found bag that has broken pieces on it, things like that. I make a perfect backpack and then they broke it down. <laughs> and they break. <laughs> Distress it, I think is the official term, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. They're, they're just stressing it. <laughs> stressing it maybe <laughs> and even um ellie's backpack i had to make it with half of a piece of hardware because the other strap wasn't there like it, it had been broken out so we we'd put it on and then i i trim it a little 
shorter than it needed and then they'd just rough it up <laughs> so it was amazing so you've just brought up a, a really important point that i think people want to know more about like you have a good day job uh, when we were talking last year and you were busy and we said, well, it's time to quit your day job. And you say that is never going to happen. You've got a good job. It it challenges you. It satisfies you. How do you find that balance between this really good job and this really wonderful hobby that you have? Well, I, it's not a hobby. It's a side hustle, isn't it? So this really good job and this really good side hustle. Well, there is a, a, a very difficult time balancing it out. I am a salaried employee. I'm a manager for uh, six employees. So I go through the uh, performance review process, plus I work with clients and I, I'm fully engaged on projects where I'm the first line of support. And so I am the person the customer comes to before they talk to my developers or my quality assurance team or, or anything like that. So. I do have a supervisory role across both the people side as well as the project side. Um, so I, I do have an amazing job. It, it's highly engaging, but being able to step away from a computer and come into a room where it's all hands-on is a completely different mindset when it comes to working purely with your brain and staring at a monitor to working purely with your hands and, and making something, physically making something. My vacation days are all taken up with teaching or presentations or Quilt Canada or, or things like that. Uh, just a, a week and a half ago, I took a couple of days off to judge the bags in a quilt show for the Central Alberta Quilt Guild as well as do a trunk show on stage. My vacation days are not vacation. <laughs> My vacation days are engaging, uh, being with people and, and presenting and sharing a love of creativity. And I'll admit eventually I'm gonna walk away from the day job. <laughs> that is something that I'm hoping to, to turn out creations into a, a bigger thing that will replace it. But at the same time, there's still a side of me that says, maybe I'll still contract on that, that, that software side. Cause you know, there's, there's something very rewarding about releasing a new software to 4,800 employees across the U S like that's what our last one was. And knowing that your customer wants you on those calls with the executives, because I provide that support to them and I give them those words and that sense of confidence in the project. It's a hard balance. <laughs> so how often do you have to say no? I learned to say no in both the day job and in the side hustle almost every day. I, I do have to do that. And that could be somebody contacting me within a O creation saying, I have the best design for you. I know you want to make this into a pattern. Nope. Nope. I, I don't have the mental capacity to come up with the details for that one. Um, or no, I just don't have the time. Uh, so th every day there is some kind of no. But at the same time, I attended the Threads of Success, a conference put out at the same time as uh, the Houston Quilt Market one year. And one of the things we learned in, in this conference was don't say no, but say yes and find a way to make it happen, which is a great guideline for somebody starting a business that is their full-time gig. The no's have to happen for me due to time constraints, but when something comes along where I think, ooh, that sounds really hard, that's what I say yes to because that's the stretch on the brain. That's the the challenge and if somebody dares tell to tell me that you can't do that oh watch me <laughs> so do you have lines or rules for yourself that you just don't cross like you just they keep you from overextending yourself you know I used to say one teaching teaching engagement per month that used to be a line that I I didn't cross but I've I've changed it to, to two if every other weekend I am doing something. 
Now, whether that's a teaching engagement or that is a, a presentation or that is focused on a pattern release, two things per month. That is what I limit myself to, two things per month. If people are interested in making some of your patterns or learning from you, do you have a place that you teach your classes? So I actually work directly with quilt shops or with guilds or groups that want to hire me so that I can teach them at their skill level and the pattern they want, because bigs are very personal, <laughs> or even just specific techniques that they want. So I do have classes coming up at Emmeline Bakes, as well as small groups. I have um, a local group out of Red Deer that is hiring me specifically to come out and teach them. I do post any classes or upcoming events on my website at uh, ocreations.com. I do have an events page that I keep everything listed on. And you've got a whole catalog of patterns. Where do they find that? They will find those on my website at uh, ocreations.com. And there's, oh, I want to say there's two free patterns. One's a sleep mask because I had to make one for my husband for Christmas. So I may as well pattern it. <laughs> um, another one is the peanut tote, which is a, uh, a, a shopping tote that you can make out of canvas. And then if you sign up for my newsletter at uh, ocreations.com, there's the Owen organizer. It's a $5 pattern that you get for free with a code just for signing up for my newsletter. And then I have about a dozen patterns on there that are all purchasable online and PDF downloads. So you get it immediately. Well, thank you very much for being on the show with me today. It was so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much, Karen, for having me. It's been a delight. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Tara Sinclair. I just loved hearing about where her skills have taken her. If you would like to check out her website, her shop, or get details of her workshops, I'll leave her links in the video description notes below. If you'd like to follow her on Instagram or Facebook or just drop her a note, I'll also leave her contact information there too. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. And all are now available as a podcast on YouTube Music. Take care, and I'll see you next time.